Order members, we now move on to questions to the Assembly Commission. But before I call Mr McNulty for the first question, I want to make the Assembly aware that the Speaker has today made provision in relation to remote participation to allow for commission, commission members answering oral questions to be able to do so on the same basis as Ministers. As Mr Buchanan is self-isolating and has been unable to arrange for an alternative member to attend the Chamber and answer on his behalf, the Speaker is satisfied that he may do so remotely. I now call Justin McNulty. I thank the member for his question. Uh, I am also very mindful of the recent debate the Assembly held on International Women's Day on promoting a gender-sensitive Assembly, which also focused on improving the gender balance within the Assembly. I can inform the member that the Commission has asked for a paper on these issues to be brought to its next full meeting. The Commission will have to take account of the fact that maternity provisions as they relate to members' salary are set independently and not by the Assembly Commission. The salary that a member is entitled to receive under the determination made by the Independent Financial Review Panel in March 2016 is not affected by the fact that the member is having a baby. However, the Commission is aware that members have asked about what may be done to assist a member with her representation of duties when she is having a baby, and that is one of, of the issues which will be discussed by the Assembly Commission at its next meeting in the context of the matters within its responsibilities. Clearly, the Commission cannot alter any matters that fall outside its remit, for example, the co-option of a replacement member during a period of maternity, but the Commission will consider those matters that do fall with it, its, within its responsibilities. The Commission is also aware that there are likely to be issues related to a member's work here in Parliament buildings and the provisions of standing orders, for example, participating in debates or voting. These would be for the Committee on Procedures to address. However, the Member can be assured that the Commission will give full consideration to any aspects under the Commission's remit. I would encourage all Members to pass on their views on this matter to their Commission Member. And I call Justin McNulty for supplementary. I thank the Member for his answer. I think the Member will agree that we must do more to encourage and empower women to stand for election. And in that regard, can I ask what plans, what specific plans does the Assembly Commission have to bring forward maternity provision for elected members? Please outline the decision making process and can you provide details of how long that process will take? Thank you. Um, well, as I outlined in, in the response, uh, our next meeting will probably be within the next four to five weeks. Uh, we will have a paper on that or at that meeting indicating what the Commission can do as the Commission's responsibility. Obviously, we've got just over 30 female members and 90 members in total, obviously. So uh, that paper will include all options, and obviously that will include maternity, paternity, and adoption issues. So it's not just a female having a baby. The, there can be all other adoption issues that has relation. So that paper will be broad. I can assure the member all issues will be looked at uh, on his specific issue. And I call Liz Kimmins. Um, can I ask, would the, would the Commission also consider measures to make the Assembly more family friendly through childcare provision for members and staff? Yes, in, in the past, uh, in the past, the, the commission has looked at that, and there was a paper, uh, probably approximately two meetings back. So I will ask that the uh, director, in, in response, to that bring that to the commission again. But yes, that was looked at, uh, and I think we are still waiting on additional information from from memory. But I will get a, a full and detailed response to the member on that specific point. Moving on, I call Pam Cameron. Question number two. And I call John O'Dowd, who will be answering on behalf of the Commission. Gormay uh, uh, Deputy Speaker. And with your permission, uh, Deputy Speaker, I group question two and three together, so I may need an extra minute. And I thank the members for their questions. The external lighting policy, the external lighting of Parliament buildings is covered by the Parliament Buildings Special Lighting Policy, which was first agreed by the Assembly Commission in 2014 and then updated last year. Under the policy, which is available on the Assembly website, the Commission agreed that the building will be lit annually on four days to mark International Women's Day, St Patrick's Day, the 12th of July and Armistice Day. In addition, requests for special lighting to mark 
Other occasions or events can be made by members subject to cross-designation support and by registered charities, public sector bodies, community or other non-profit making organisations. Such requests must meet certain criteria to be approved. Those criteria include that the special lighting must be in connection with an event that is of exceptional local, national or international significance and or achievement, of constitutional or democratic significance, a significant anniversary of a significant local, national or international event. Other than the four days agreed by the Commission, special lighting will not be approved to mark an event that occurs repeatedly unless it is a significant anniversary of that event. Furthermore, more, no such event can be marked by special lighting more than once in any three-year period. All requests for special lighting are put to the Commission, and approval requires Commission consent. An application to light the building to red to mark the 17th day of the remembrance for victims of terrorism on the 11th of March was made by the South East Fermanagh Foundation. The request did not meet the requirements of the policy because the building had been illuminated in 2019 to mark the European Day, and it was put to the Commission. Consensus was not achieved, therefore the request was not approved. The Commission has been considering whether lighting of the building might be appropriate to mark additional events over and above the existing four days chosen uh, by it and named in the current policy. That consideration is continuing. Thank you. And, and can I remind Commission members, if they need extra time, they can request. So I uh, call Pam Cameron for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for his response. This decision has understandably caused great hurt and disrespect to thousands of victims of terrorism within Northern Ireland. Uh, can the member outline exactly how consensus is determined and reached by the Assembly Commission? I call John O'Dowd to answer. Uh, in relation to consensus, consensus means that all Commission members are in agreement and that our members are not given a contrary view in respect of a matter. In respect of special lighting requests, Commission members have 48 hours to confirm or object to the recommendations of officials as to whether a request for special lighting should be approved or declined, and none response is taking as confirmation of the recommendation of officials. I call Rosemary Barton. Um, thank you, Mr O'Dowd, so far for your answers. Um, you, you speak about the events that can have uh, lighting, have the Parliament buildings lit up. Uh, can you give some idea of what you, what, you would cons what you would be considering as additional events more than the four days? Uh, thank the member for her question. Uh, each application would have to be taken on its own merits, uh, matched against the policy and the recommendations of officials, and then Commission members would have to respond in due course. But each case would be matched against the policy of officials, recommendations, etc. Colette Michurin. I get to ask King Corlett. I thank the member for his answers thus far. Um, Mr O'Dowd, would you agree that the lighting policy and the overall ethos and symbolism of this House needs to be inclusive and representative of all the communities that this House represents, and that presently there is a massive imbalance in symbolism which needs to be addressed? As I mentioned in my original answer, the Assembly Commission is attempting to bring forward a policy in relation to lighting. Uh, which is broader and more representative of the community the Assembly represents. It is also looking at an artefacts policy in relation to symbolism around the building as well to better represent uh, the, the wide diverse communities this building now represents. Moving on, I call Trevor Clark. Uh, question number three. Oh, sorry. Question three. Uh, to ask the Commission sorry, what additional subsidies have been paid to the catering contracts and such. Yeah. Question three, yes. Uh, and uh, Dolores Kelly will be answering on behalf of the Commission. Um, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member uh, for his question. The Assembly Commission requires that catering services are provided to members and all other building users during all the hours when the Assembly is operating. So during sitting times that are uncertain or out of the ordinary, for example, the later than normal times that have occurred recently with plenary sittings, catering services continue to be provided until 30 minutes after the House rises. Where the cost of providing these services exceeds the money taken in through catering sales, the extra cost is incurred in the Assembly Commission. 
This operating cost is sometimes referred to as a subsidy and it varies on a monthly basis depending on the level of sales within the catering outlets. Due to the extremely low footfall in Parliament buildings during the pandemic, the sales within catering outlets have been severely reduced. This reduction in the level of sales has led to an increase in costs given the reliance on the sales income to assist with offsetting the catering operating cost. By way of comparison, from April 2019 to February 2020, the cost of catering was £157,000, while for the period during the pandemic, from April 2020 to February 2021, this cost was £327,000. £327, the Member may wish to note, however, that the majority of the cost to the Commission arise from the cost of staffing within the catering facilities. In line with other publicly funded entities, the Commission did not request that the catering contractor make any member of staff redundant during this period. Additionally, the Commission did not seek funding for this increase in costs over the past year as it was able to deliver savings across its other categories of costs to meet this increase. The member will know that the catering and cleaning contracts are held by the same contractor and one of the measures taken in response to the coronavirus pandemic was to allocate a number of catering staff to sanitising duties for hand contact areas etc throughout Parliament buildings. Therefore, the staff costs of this additional and necessary sanitising are included in the catering cost between April 2020 and August 2020 until a, a formal variation to the contract was agreed and introduced in September 2020 that recorded the hours dedicated each week to this task. And I call Trevor Clark for supplementary. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the member for the answer? And I want to put on record that my question in no way reflects anything in regards to staff, because I mean the staff have been professional, and particularly it's been difficult for them over the last 12 months. But I suppose where I want to go in terms of the question is that there is an uncertainty for the staff in terms of their hours and indeed their contracts. There's a difficulty for members in some particular days going down because of the seating arrangements. There's the other facilities that we did have in the building in terms of use for members at unsociable hours. So all of those things rolled together. I suppose where I would like to know is when the Commission will make a decision to try and bring the contract to back to as near normal as possible so as that gives a certainty to the staff that they know when they come in in the morning what time they're working to and they know that in terms of the job and their job security is safe and that we can get back to normal practice within this building and where members can go and eat and dine without any difficulties. And I call Dolores Kelly on behalf of the Commission. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Well, as the member will know, uh, we are guided by the health regulations that pertain not only to this place but to all uh, facilities and all providers of services across Northern Ireland. And we would hope that in the uh, forthcoming uh, debates and executive meetings uh, in April and thereafter, and as the uh, uh, statistics uh, continue to improve and the vaccination programme continues to roll out, that we will be in a better position after April to start to look at whether or not visitors uh, can resume. But that will be something that the Commission will be debating at our next meeting. And uh, we had anticipated that the health regulations would prevent uh, the public from uh, entering the building until at least the end of April. But we would hope that mid-April onwards we'll start to uh, have some further relaxation which then will assist with some of the catering and uh, income, one hopes. I call Colin Gilnew. Well, may I get last can call you and thank you to the Commission for the answers thus far. Would the Commission agree that it will be important to ensure that workers employed by catering and other contractors do not suffer as a result of the Assembly's response to the COVID crisis? Thank uh, the member for his question and in my initial response you will have noted that no member of staff was made redundant and people were redeployed to other necessary duties in line with the COVID uh, restrictions, the sanitising for example. And I can assure the member that remains position of the Commission that no staff were furloughed either. As, uh, uh, as in line with many other public bodies as well. So we, we do know that we have a very tight-knit, very dedicated workforce here who look after the needs of members and indeed the public. And uh, therefore, uh, their interests are all, also form part of the broader considerations as well as value for money and the public purse. Moving on, I call Martina Anderson. Question number four. 
And I call Robbie Butler, who will be answering on behalf of the Commission. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I thank the member for her uh, question. The European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages is an international agreement. The United Kingdom Government signed the Charter in 2000 and ratified it then in 2001. <coughs> it is designed to protect and promote regional or minority languages as a threatened aspect of Europe's cultural heritage. The United Kingdom Government recognised Welsh, Scottish Gaelic, Scotch, Irish, Ulster Scots, Cornish and Manx Gaelic as regional or minority languages under that same Charter. The Charter contains a non-discrimination clause concerning the use of these languages and provides for measures offering active support for their use across a range of areas, including administrative settings. The Charter obliges the United Kingdom Government to ensure, amongst other things, that administrative authorities use regional or minority languages, but it should be noted that uh, neither the Assembly uh, as a regional legislature nor the Assembly Commission are administrative authorities or a body acting on behalf of such an authority for the purposes of this Charter. There is no domestic national legislation incorporating the Charter and consequently the Assembly or the Assembly Commission do not have obligations as a matter of domestic law to comply with the provisions of this Charter. However, the Assembly Commission is of course mindful of the contents of the New Decade New, uh, new Approach Agreement. The Commission anticipates that it will have to consider and review a number of areas within its remit in the context of any legislation passed by this Assembly under New Decade New Approach or any other legislation. In addition, the Commission has also indicated that it awaits the decisions of the Committee of Procedures and this Assembly in relation to the detail of making provisions for simultaneous translation. The Commission will, the commission will then ensure the required resources and changes to services are put in place. And I call Martina Anderson for supplementary. Uh, and Coaltis, as, as to Fragra. I want to thank the member for, uh, for that answer. Would the member agree with me that um, Irish language signage in this building would very much be reflective of the community that it serves? And I call Robbie Butler to answer on behalf of the Commission. I thank the, the member for her supplementary question. I think it would be important to, uh, on behalf of the Commission to, to address that and maybe perhaps more, um, to be aware of what the Commission actually has actually done. The Commission's education services currently provide online sessions for schools, including Irish medium schools and education officer uh, who is available to deliver sessions in Irish. Work is also underway to update and translate sections of the education service uh, uh, website into Irish. This work is nearing completion and this resource will be made available to, to Irish medium education in coming months. Hansard reports assembly proceedings in whatever language is used. If Irish is used, that is the language and that, that is how it's reported. And in normal circumstances, simultaneous translation is provided for the speaker and the two clerks at the table during plenary sittings. Hansard also provides some translation into and from Irish on demand, depending on capacity and when resources allow. The Commission avails of a framework for the provision of interpretation, translation and transcription services for the Northern Ireland public sector. Irish is one of the languages included in that framework, and the framework includes a range of services such as face-to-face -face interpreting services, telephone interpreting services, sign language interpreting services, and translation and transcription services. The member might be aware that the speaker again held an event on the 10th of March 2021 uh, to mark Irish Language Week. This uh, year's events took the form of a short virtual class focusing on the Irish language in parliamentary context and highlighted phrases often required in the Assembly. And on the member's specific point, uh, currently Braille language is available in the Great Hall. Pictorial signage for the toilets is also provided in the entrances uh, to the toilets on the ground floor and the Commission, I'm sure in time, uh, will consider anything that's put to the Commission. Thank you. And I call Kelly Armstrong for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Commission member for his answers so far. Um, I just wanted to ask for clarification. I'm glad to hear the member did bring it up that sign language um, would be welcomed in this place. Can I just say that the Commission, in waiting for simultaneous translation to come forward, is not currently providing any alternatives for someone like myself with a hearing difficulty. There are no subtitles for me. Um, I don't want to wait, or is the Commission going to wait until the dis well, disciplinary or, dis Disability Discrimination Act has to come forward before someone like myself who has a hearing impairment will finally have subtitles for this place? I call Pam Cameron. Oh, sorry, my mistake. 
call Robbie Butler to answer the question on behalf of the Commission. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. It's, it's great to know that I'm not the only imperfect person in this chamber. Uh, thank the member for her question, and I know she is uh, an absolutely outstanding advocate uh, for those with disabilities, and particularly uh, her own disability. And I've been with you when you've raised issues uh, at Business Committee and on the Commission. This, so I certainly will give an undertaking uh, to write to you on, on that subject, and the Commission uh, will take that very seriously. Thank you. And I now call Pam Cameron for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the member for his answers. And uh, I was wanting to ask uh, around the provision of sign languages as well, because obviously the deaf community, uh, for their first language isn't English, it isn't Irish, it's actually signing, and communication is very difficult. And I think there's a, a real issue around equality in terms of uh, communication and access to information for the deaf community. So will the Commission be looking at uh, provision of sign language for uh, plenary settings as an example going forward. I thank the member uh, for her, for her uh, question. And I, I suppose if we look at the response by the executive to COVID and when they did actually provide sign language, and, and in many ways it, it showed the value of it. And if we're going to value our community and all those that are part of it, uh, I would imagine that this will be a matter for the Commission to uh, attend to. And uh, if you're happy, I will also write to you uh, on that issue. Moving on, and I call John Stewart. Please, Deputy Speaker. And John Blair will be answering on behalf of the Commission. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for, for his question. The current Wi Fi network was installed in Parliament buildings in 2013 and originally consisted of 84 wireless access points located throughout the building. As the current system supported a maximum of 100 access points, an additional 16 were purchased and installed in 2015 in order to improve the overall Wi-Fi signal coverage for, for building users. The COVID-19 pandemic resulted in significantly increased demand for Wi-Fi services by members and staff, and there were some Wi-Fi connectivity and signal quality issues for some members, particularly in regard to video conferencing. Much of this is due to the nature of the construction of Parliament buildings, which presents a number of challenges to providing universal Wi-Fi coverage in all areas. In response to this, webcams were provided for use by MLAs and party support staff. The webcams have been deployed on desktop PCs in Parliament buildings, and as these use the assembly wired network, they provide a much more reliable service. The current Wi-Fi network shares the assembly's main internet connection which is monitored on an ongoing basis, and this is currently operating well within the capacity of the connection. IS Office also recently reissued the written advice to members on how best to manage Wi-Fi connections on mobile devices. Should members experience any difficulty with Wi-Fi access or performance in Parliament buildings, they should, of course, contact the IS Office service desk, ideally at the time when the difficulty is experienced, so that the matter could be investigated. The IS Office will continue to monitor the current Wi-Fi service in Parliament buildings and will respond appropriately to any specific issues as they arise. As the current system is not fully, uh, as the current system is not fully meeting the Assembly's needs and is approaching end of life, IS Office intends to undertake a review of the system and set up a project to replace the Wi-Fi network infrastructure before the end of the current Assembly mandate. I call John Stewart for supplementary. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the member for that response, very thorough that it was. I don't think I'm the only person in the House that does, at, from time to time, feel like banging their head against a brick wall when it comes to accessing either the Wi-Fi network or the network itself, the hardwired one. I've just come from two Zoom meetings where both through the PC in the office and had to turn off the camera. Now, that was probably a good thing for those at the other end of the line, but not so practical for the actual runnings of the meeting. It just seems to be, with the ongoing amount of meetings that are taking place, that we're going to need more more and more access. Is there any way that we can look at speeding up that connection so that we can get more for the ongoing amount of meetings that we're doing? Thank you. Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for the further question. I think we all of us, Deputy Speaker, have experienced problems with slow connection, be it at meetings in the building or trying to connect virtually. Uh, Wi-Fi speeds can be affected by many different factors, including physical obstructions, proximity to the nearest Wi-Fi access point, 
um, and the number of devices currently connected on assembly sitting decks or access points, for example, particularly those around the assembly chamber, are being required to service a large number of devices, and this can cause the delays referred to in connections. As already advised, due to the nature of its construction, Parliament buildings presents some challenges to providing universal Wi-Fi coverage in all areas. However, the IS office will continue to monitor the service on a daily basis and will respond to requests for support as they arise. Moving on, I call Sinead Bradley. Thank you. Question six. And could we have Keith Buchanan uh, on the screen? Thank you. Uh, and I call Keith Buchanan, who will be answering on behalf of the Assembly Commission. With your permission, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I will group questions 6 and 15, so I may need a few extra seconds to give the answer or the response. I thank the members, both members, for their questions. As the members may recall, the House was last updated on the Youth Assembly on the 8th of December. Since then, a number of important developments have occurred, and I will outline some of these for the members. Assembly officials have continued their work to develop the practicalities and arrangements needed to enable the Youth Assembly to start its work. In particular, a co-design panel of young people was established to help shape the principles and best approach to re recruitment for the Youth Assembly. The panel met during December and January and produced and agreed its report at the end of January. Based on the panel's findings, officials have subsequently designed and developed proposals for the recruitment of the members of the Youth Assembly. In addition, the Speaker established a Youth Assembly advisory group to provide the Commission with advice and guidance from the youth sector and other relevant stakeholders in relation to establishing, implementing and reviewing the operation of the Youth Assembly during its two-year pioneer phase. The group comprises the Speaker, Senior Assembly Officials, Professor Laura Lundy from the Centre for Children's Rights at Queen's University, the Children's Commissioner Kulu Osumu, and adults and young people from the Northern Ireland Youth Forum, Youth Action and the Education Authority. The recruitment proposals developed by the officials were pre presented to and considered by the advisory group at the start of this month. The group very much welcomed the engagement with young people and the co-design panel report. The group also provided some very useful and practical advice and endorsed the concept of the recruitment proposals. Officials subsequently considered the group's advice, refined the proposals and presented them to the Commission at a meeting last Thursday past. They are now being considered by the Commission and a decision will be taken soon. Looking ahead and subject to agreement, it is anticipated that the recruitment of members to the Youth Assembly will take place during April and May in the hope that it will be able to meet for the first time before summer. That is a challenging timescale, not least because of the current public situation, but we are committed to doing all we can to meet that aim. Finally, I think it worth emphasising that the work and proceedings of the Youth Assembly will not be party political and its members will represent their own lived experience and the views of young people in general. And of course, you need Bradley for supplementary. And I thank the member for the answer and I welcome the detail in that answer, particularly the timeline for recruitment. Um, could the member elaborate on uh, telling me how you're going to make sure that any youth assembly is reflective of our increasingly diverse society? And does he anticipate that the use of technology, as he is so ably demonstrating today, will be a tool in, in use in engaging with more young people and this place? And if I keep you can to provide a, a supplementary answer. Okay, well, I'll take your second point first, if I may. With regard to technology, obviously the aim is to get the Youth Assembly operating prior to the summer. Obviously, right, restrictions would need to have ease to allow the 90 young people in the chamber. So obviously technology, I would suspect at this stage, will be used because purely for social distancing reasons. With regard to ref reflectiveness, I can assure the member that all Section 75 will be adhered to and uh, the, the first the first numbers of, of um, the method of selection i'll put it will be 18 times three which is obviously 54 which gives you a broad spectrum across northern ireland then the remaining 36 will anticipate and make sure that it's reflective of all section 75 uh, and it's, it's very important that ha that happens so uh, and it is a random selection approach so for example if mid ulster had three females the, the next election process to, to incorporate the remaining 36 would, would counterbalance that in accuracy, if you understand what I'm uh, getting at. So it will, to assure the member, cover all Section 75 aspects. And I call Kelly Armstrong for a brief supplementary. Thank you much, Deputy Speaker. Um, just to ask the Commission member um, if you could clarify the issues that the Youth Assembly are currently um, 
considering that they may consider in the future, um, will that link in with any future possible citizens' assembly, as mentioned, a new decade, new approach? I call Keith Buchanan to provide an answer on behalf of the Assembly Commission. Thank you. My, my, thank you, Madam, for the, for the, the, the uh, question. My understanding is that the 90 members will be very much their own uh, uh, destiny in regard to it. So the 90 young people will ultimately be a, a, a young person's assembly. Out of that, there will be up to a possible four committees, which they will agree which committees they will, for a better word, shadow. So it's very much a two-year um, test phase, effectively, with the young people in the direction of that, or ultimately, you know, heading whatever direction they see fit. Uh, and obviously, shadowing, we'll use that term, shadowing whatever committee they need. So very much a two-year programme, based on how good that goes, obviously, then it will be developed and indeed up to other commission members in the future to see how far that goes on. So it's, it's very much driven by them, uh, is the way I'll finish that answer, very much driven by those within it. And that is the end of our period of time of questions to the Assembly Commission. I'd uh, invite members to take their ease for a few moments before we return to the debate on the coronavirus restriction regulations. <laughs>